We're still applauding after the uh, full day today. I, I know this is going to be a great session as well. Uh, on a day where we have had so many powerful women, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next. Uh, our, our next speaker has been uh, designated as one of the 100 most powerful women by Forbes magazine on a number of occasions. Uh, Sri Mulyani Indrawati is the managing director of the World Bank Group. She's been in that position since 2010, and she oversees the bank's operations in all the regions of the world. Previously, she served as Indonesia's Minister of Finance and Coordinator for Economic Affairs, and at that point, she guided that country's economic policy navigating successfully the global economic crisis, implementing key reforms, and fighting corruption. She's also credited with helping to steer Indonesia through the transition from autocracy to democracy. Before that, she led the Indonesian National Development Planning Agency, and at that point, she was charged with helping Indonesia recover from the devastating 2004 tsunami. And she was also executive director at the International Monetary Fund. Her efforts and her dedication have not gone unnoticed internationally. In 2006, she was named Euromoney Magazine's Global Finance Minister of the Year. And Emerging Markets newspaper selected her as Asia's best finance minister for two years in a row. I am delighted to say that she's going to speak to us uh, this afternoon on issues related to security, democracy, and development. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sri Mulyani Indrawati. Thank you, Don, for a very generous introduction. I've been invited today to speak about security, development, and democracy. As the introductory remark, uh, you may ask, what is the managing director of the World Bank and former finance minister of Indonesia have to say about this issue? Uh, to be honest, it's quite a lot. I will try to share with you this afternoon. At the World Bank, I've been tasked to oversee over work in 187 countries in six diverse regions, so basically the whole bank operation. Several of these countries are making transition to democracy, just like Indonesia back in 1998, 1997. Actually, if you look at uh, the history of Indonesia, it's supposed to be back in 1950, but we are then under the authoritarian government for almost 30 years. And then we have this reformasi, we call it in Indonesia, which is actually adopting, again, the new real democracy. So just like in Indonesia, which is about one and a half decade ago. Many of these countries which is transitioned to the uh, democracy are classified as middle income, uh, also like Indonesia today. In my work, lessons learned from Indonesia often come to my mind. You cannot blame, uh, because the story of Indonesia is uh, really my university on public policy making process, as well as really understanding about the real challenge and complication of development. My work over several years as academic, as an activist, and as policy maker leads me to three observations on the topic of today's discussion, security, democracy, and development. My first observation is that the lack of security is a serious obstacle to development. I think this is obvious, but I would like to give you some of the supporting facts. Um, as noted in World Development Report 2011, over a billion and a half people in the world live in situation of fragility, conflict, or large-scale organized crime. This makes the lack of security one of the primary development challenges for our time. The fact that no low-income, fragile, or conflicted, affected country has yet to achieve a single millennium development goal is actually a testimony to the above, to the havoc 
that is wrought by insecurity. It is for this reason that the World Bank, along with other partner agencies, is closely engaged with national reformers in building the basic institution for security in fragile and post-conflict situation. To break the cycle of insecurity and reduce the risk of their recurrence, national reformers and their international partners need to build the legitimate institution that can provide a sustained level of citizen security, justice, and job, offering a stake in society to group that may otherwise receive more respect and recognition from engaging in armed violence. But is this enough? My answer to this is no. This leads to my second observation. While development needs security, without democracy, it is not sustainable. This is uh, the experience from my own country, Indonesia. In 1998, Indonesia ended three decades of rule by President Suharto then. These three decades has seen a strong growth leading to increasing material standard of living and poverty reduction to many millions of Indonesia. So Indonesia was actually seen as a poster boy or poster country, including even what you call it the East Asian miracle back in 1980s. As a head of economic and social research at the University of Indonesia at that time, back in Jakarta uh, in the mid 1990s I was expected, uh, of course, to be loyal to the government and to actually work and support. But like many of the younger colleagues, which are actually benefiting from the progress being made under President Suharto's time, I had begun to question the wisdom of economic success without justice, accountability, and inclusion, and began to speak out in the media and a protest rallies. This is why uh, was at the Senayan, that is our parliamentary building in Jakarta, on the mid-May 1998. I was there not far, not far from the security forces who shot four students. You could say that that moment was my Tahrir Square moment, using the current terms of Tahrir moment in, in Arab Spring. This pattern has been repeated many times, in which you have a quite impressive, impressive development achievement, but lack of accountability, inclusiveness, and transparency. I saw this pattern again in the Arab Spring last year with the demand for justice, inclusion, and accountability. And with spread of information, technology, information technology, social accountability, and a more transparent global environment, I expect such movement to grow. This is why I believe that democracy is needed to sustain development. Each country, certainly in the midst of this transition, will face a unique challenges and require a different solution. Correcting injustice and building an economy that offers opportunity to all and treating all people equally are major challenges. There are no one-size-fits-all solution, and there are no one, what you call it, a pattern of sequencing that can be applied. My own experience, sometimes you are so excited with this democracy, and then you suffer a little bit setback, and especially in related to my third observation. The common element to all successful approaches is through the building of effective and accountable public institution. These institutions are the lifeblood which allow development and especially democracy to deliver the promise that is the people's prosperity. This brings me to my third observation. While development cannot proceed without security and it, is, it needs democracy, if it, is not, it cannot be sustained unless there is an effective public institution or good governance for support. And this is what is actually the struggle because good governance 
mean clear rule, laws, and policy, a disciplined civil service with the capacity to implement policy as intended, a transparent budget process that allocate public resource according to priority, oversight mechanism to monitor official action, and the ability of individual to seek effective redress when impartiality is not respected. That will like, take a long time. Institution building is actually the core challenge of development. And this can only be built through uh, a quite uh, uh, long process. A system of good governance encompasses a multitude of actors, government agency, formal oversight institution, sub-national government, especially for a country as big as Indonesia, and I'm sure many countries who has the size, the sub-national local government capacity, especially in delivering development program, is very, very critical. And certainly also local communities, civil society, private sector, and political actors and institutions. In a well-functioning system, accountability relationship between these different actors help ensure that public policy support development, that services are delivered efficiently and equitably, and that corruption is held in check. I know corruption is on, not a problem of the low-income country or developing country, it's a problem everywhere, but whether this can be held in check with the system which is actually established in each country. Every country will have to find its own way of building strong institution that support the development process. All this introductory remark, which is read by Don, is actually my struggle of five years in the cabinet of Indonesia after reformasi is really struggling of building the sound and clean institution at the Minister of Finance. And I can give you a very long talk about that, more than one hour, of how very interesting, challenging, complicated, but it's not impossible. This is something that takes time, of course, and you cannot have a good institu institution overnight, or even over a year. If you talk about Arab Spring, today is already a year, and everybody now starts asking and questioning where it will lead this country in actually leading this democracy that will deliver the promise that is prosperity, accountability, transparency, and inclusiveness. The good news uh, is that country actually now can learn faster by reflecting on their own experience, but also by learning from the experience of other countries. Good experience from elsewhere offer lessons. Bad experience also offer lessons if nothing else, on what not to do. At the World Bank, in this case, we believe that we can become more effective by helping countries share their experience with each other. In conclusion, I would like to leave you with my three observations. Development without security is elusive. Development with security is difficult to sustain without democracy and both development and democracy need the effective public institution in order to take root and thrive. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the President of the Republic of Kosovo, Atifeta Yayaga, and the United States Ambassador to Kosovo, Christopher Dell. Good afternoon. It's traditional to say that it's an honor to introduce a head of state. In this case, it is truly a distinct personal pleasure to be able to introduce to you President Yahyaga. Um, it's also a challenge, because uh, I realize that Kosovo is a country 13 years after the war is largely 
many Americans could no longer find it. And until just over a year ago, uh, President Yahyago was not a household name in her own country. So there's lots to tell you about her, but I'm going to resist the temptation to bore you by reading a CV. And instead, I want to leave you with two thoughts I hope that you'll remember about President Yahyaga. The first is breaking barriers. As a career law enforcement officer, she joined the Kosovo police force soon after the NATO air war in 1999 and quickly rose through the ranks to become the deputy director general, the second ranking officer in the Kosovo police service, um, the most senior woman in an official government capacity short of the political ministers uh, by far. She set an example from early on in her career by her hard work, her dedication to law enforcement, and her commitment to serving the people of Kosovo. And that brings me to the second quality I want you, I hope you'll remember about President Yahyaga today, um, that she truly does represent the young Kosovo that has emerged from the ashes of the vicious efforts by Slobodan Milosevic's Serbia to practice genocide on the people of the country. For much of the world, the image of Kosovo is still dominated by scenes of the war, of the refugees being driven from the country, and people still think of it largely in terms of the Balkans and the Balkan struggles of the 90s. President Yahyaga, as the youngest head of state in Europe and the first female ever elected head of state, in the, by, democratically elected head of state in the Balkans, I think is the ideal representative of the new Kosovo that's emerged from the ashes of that struggle. It is a country that, while proud of its heritage, proud of its Albanian culture, proud of its Islamic heritage, is nonetheless firmly committed to the future. And to paraphrase President Sirleaf Johnson at lunch today, has his face clearly turned towards the future of the transatlantic European community and values. It's a country that the President reflects not only in her youth, but also in her commitment to democracy, to private sector-led economic growth, to developing a, multi, a truly multi-ethnic country in the Western Balkans. And so I hope with these two things that you will take away an image of Kosovo that is not the image of Slobodan Milosevic and the struggle of the 90s, but rather of, Co of Europe's youngest nation, uh, a country full of energy and dynamism, and a country that is truly marvelously represented by its president, Atifeta Yahyaga. Thank you. <laughs> Grace, thank you very much. And I always thank you for this very good introduction of me and uh, our country. Um, I think that uh, my country has been very lucky having a good friend like is Chris Dell, an extremely professional ambassador like he has done for these past years performing in my country. Excellencies, honored guests, ladies and uh, gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to return to Georgetown and to be with you at this important gathering. In my last visit in Washington in December, I had the honor of joining Secretary Clinton, who has done so much throughout her career, and especially in the last four years, to make the world a better and a safer place. As she launched an inspiring initiative to involve women in the public service. I would like to thank Rai Shah and the USID for hosting this conference, for bringing together so many wonderful, illustrious, and thoughtful people from around the world. We are here to consider issues that are having a fundamental impact on the lives of the people, the fortunes of the countries, and indeed, the state of the world. It is fitting that we have this discussion in the United States, a proven democracy that exercises a strong and constructive role in the world affairs, and the country that I and the people of Kosovo hold dear, very dear in our hearts. 
As we meet in the Washington DC to discuss the frontiers in development theme, I pose this question. How can we collaborate to improve the lives of the people and strengthen the material means and moral fabric of societies while reducing conflicts that produces turmoil, ruin lives, and undermine progress. Our conflicts are numerous, and their sources are increasing. Conflicts can be born of ethnic and sectarian strife, political impasse, economic deprivation, or lack of the natural resources. These are large and searching questions. They require answers from virtually every corner of human endeavor. Economic growth, social cohesion, political participation, scientific innovation, and cultural exchange. Collectively, the answers must have a vision. They demand wisdom. They call for the leadership. Since I became a president of my country a little more than a year ago, I have had the great fortune to represent Kosovo throughout the world. And this is the case here to meet with people in leadership roles, dealing with these large issues that we are all facing, whether we live in Liberia or Kosovo. As you know, Kosovo is Europe's youngest state in two aspects, having become independent in 2008, and because the overage age among its 2 million citizens is 26. I stand before you as someone whose past was shaped by the conflicts seen repeatedly in the 20th century the very last of which, in 1999, touched me, my family, our country, directly, and for many, tragically. It was a conflict that never needed to happen. It never should have happened. But it did happen. Because of the dictator who had the power to see distrust and create fear. He was wrong, and he was defeated. We are left to rebuild, to develop, to remember, and to not repeat the mistakes of the past. It is my mission, born from the tragedy of the 20th century last conflict, inspired by the hope brought forward into this century and supported by the human spirit residing in all of us. To succeed, this mission must address the question I posed earlier. How do we collaborate to improve the lives of the people and reduce the opportunities for the conflicts? The first answer is to build democracy through open societies that share information. When there is an information, there is enlightenment. When there is debate, there are solutions. When there is no sharing of power, no rule of law, no accountability, there is abuse, there is corruption subjugation, and indignation. When there is no democracy, there is dictatorship. And when there is dictatorship, there is conflict, especially in our globalized, wired age. We have seen this in Egypt, Myanmar, and Syria. Dictators preside over the false stability that will give way to people's undeniable desire and right to be free. 
When it comes, democracy is revelations. It's also complicated. There are elections to hold, politics to create, rights to assert, grievances to settle, and institutions to build. Often, for the first time, people may speak openly and genuinely. To many, it's exhilarating. For others, it can be disappointing when it turns out that the democracy doesn't immediately make life better. We must remember that democracy works given time to develop, mature, and deliver. People must have access to information for informed debate. Government institutions must treat citizens fairly, with dignity, while servicing their needs. Societies must develop not only the confidence to seize freedom, but to act upon it with charity and wisdom. Then democracy really works. This is what you know, and this is what I and the people of Kosovo affirm as we move through our first years as a free and democratic society, learning, adopting, and achieving. The process of democratization in Kosovo had numerous challenges. The phase of the emergency, period of rebuilding, and the overall revival was concurrent with efforts to democratize the country. I am proud we have managed to build pluralism and encourage the participation of all Kosovo communities. As a part of the process of building the fundamental of our democratic state, we reached out to find the best international practices and to implement them accordingly to Kosovo's needs. And in reaching out to other citizens of the world, we discovered that our citizens, what they want is not much different from all others want in the rest of the world. To hold their leaders accountable, to seek a better governance. And for the government to serve the people rather than for the people to serve the government. And we are exerting our full strength to meet their expectations. It is with the same determination that we are trying to mend the differences and remedy the shaken trust which still lingers due to the legacy of the war, especially between the Albanian majority and the Serbian minority. And there has been successes as Albanian-dominated institutions have extended broad autonomy and legal guarantees for protection of the rights of the Serbian community, as well as their way of life and religious tradition in Kosovo. As a result, the Serbian community in most of the Kosovo is fully integrated in the institutional life and is running the day-to-day -day business in the municipalities where it resides. Recently, in a visit of one such municipality in Štrpce, I had the pleasure of visiting a fair organized by the Serbian woman entrepreneurs whose main concern were not the ethnic divisions, but how to best create an environment that was rape for business and attractive for the foreign investments. The second answer to meeting the needs of citizens in emergent democracies 
economic development. When polls are taken in my country and many others, more than anything else, people say they want jobs, a strong economy, good health care, sound education, and a reliable infrastructure. They want to improve their lives so that their children have more opportunities than they did. This is what the development is about, growing our economies, meeting social demands, and orienting government to serve the public interests. It requires that the government have the resources and the policies to unleash the talent of each individual. While doing its best to ensure with those same resources and policies for opportunity for all. Host country government like Kosovo are both partners and beneficiaries of assistance providers. But international community must recognize that development is a balance between the short term and the long term. It also needs to learn when it is a time to end an engagement, as well as when to step in. Because when international assistance goes on for too long or becomes too pervasive, a well-meant intervention can become counterproductive. At times, this dual role of being a partner and a beneficiary can confuse expectations about what governments are supposed to accomplish and how they can deliver. Go too slow in transferring development responsibilities to local institutions and they can become too reliant. Go too fast and countries may become unstable. Acknowledging this duality is an important element to maximizing development strategies because if a country remains dependent on others to tackle its main priorities, it may never develop the ability to do so for itself. We need to recognize that over time governments, and indeed the private sector and civil society should assume full responsibility for the development of their countries. In short, democracy and development go hand in hand. Development cannot occur without people having a voice in how their affairs are decided. And democracy cannot take root if people's basic needs are not met. As my friend, who never ceases to inspire me, Madeleine Albright, has said, people want to eat and to have a say in how they are governed. Kosovo's own developments since the intervention of the NATO in 1999, which brought an end to the repression, was remarkable, but also at times slow. It went through different phases. Over 120,000 houses destroyed during the war were rebuilt with the help of our international partners. And Kosovo has changed dramatically over a few years. But we continue to be deeply concerned by the human suffering and waning of trust between the communities. International assistance in Kosovo was essential to deal with the difficulties 
of transition and revival. Comprehensive aid in post-conflict states is a vital. The period of the emergency after the war in Kosovo has lasted longer than expected. And this has slowed down the development of the country in many areas, making it more dependent on outside aid than anticipated. This economic and political dependency has at times slowed down Kosovo's state building process and consolidation of the country's political class. Kosovo's development, however, it is a joining success story. Although the engagement and the role of the local forces should have been more powerful and direct in all the phases of the Kosovo's consolidation. This fragility has impacted the further development of Kosovo in the area of politics, economics, and security. Development and security are tightly linked. Security determines the development of the country. Kosovo had a strong correlation between domestic and international mechanisms of the security. NATO peacekeeping forces deployed in Kosovo since the end of the war often has played the role not only of the guardian of Kosovo's borders with its neighboring countries, but also help the community in Kosovo to facilitate their lives and rebuild the ties between them. Which brings me to my third answer, to security and inclusion. Societies across the world are rapidly changing as new ways of thinking and new forms of self-expression evolve. People historically placed on the sidelines by the social convention and personal prejudice concerning gender, race, youth, sexual orientation, and disability are stepping forward to take their place at the table. We must make room, for we are all enriched by their inclusion, which breeds security. Security is the foundation of the state building process. Security means economic development and investment. And security guarantees the constitution of the strong and respected society. Kosovo is a developing country which has laid the foundation of a just country, seeking to create equal opportunities for all of its citizens. We have built a sound legal system and related mechanisms that guarantee the implementation of the rule of law. For many years in my country, the uniform symbolized violence and brutality. But in the last decade, Kosovo has become a country in which its citizens perceive the police force as their own, a force that looks after their security and the rule of law, regardless of which ethnic community they are serving. I was a part of building this force, and I am a strong believer that the security of an individual and the security of community means the security of the whole country. I strongly believe that security forces need to build relation with the community and help the country's development 
prosperity and democratization. Kosovo police has succeeded on this, overcoming a legacy of mistrust that was bred due to the long record of the repression by the security forces. Having said that, I also want to point out that my country, like all the countries in the region and those of the southeastern Europe, are confronted with the threat of the corruption and organized crime. The protection that Kosovo, perception that Kosovo is a corrupt country with a high rate of the organized crime has at times undermined our efforts to represent our country as a joint international and local success story. As a result, I have decisively taken leadership against corruption, a phenomenon that is destroying the dreams of ordinary citizens for a better future. In this effort, I have established the National Anti-Corruption Council, where I have assembled all the institutions and the members of the civil society to find a common solution to combat corruption. I have set the priorities and have set the general framework to combat this ill that has plagued Kosovo society, and I want a concrete outcome and the results. I am aware that this initiative that I have launched, supported by the society at large and the institutions of the country, will only be able to achieve so much in a short time span. But I have the will to change the course, and I stand ready to do it. For the sake of Kosovo, and for the sake of Kosovo's young generation, I have made the fight against corruption the top priority in my office. We cannot allow ourselves to waste the opportunity to move forward and to seek integration in international mechanisms. And we will not lose this fight. As to inclusion, I have a special perspective in this regard. Being my country's first female head of state and having climbed up the ranks of a traditionally male profession, the police force, I see the hurdles that many women in Kosovo face. Incomplete education, limited economic opportunity, domestic abuse. I know that women throughout the world confront with the same problems. As I meet with women across Kosovo, I see the challenges. I see the passion, the commitment, the drive, and the unity to change things for the better. We know that when women take control of their destinies as mothers, as wives, and as citizens, and participate as the full members of society alongside men, not only do they find rightful fulfillment but they make society stronger and governments perform better. I look forward to hosting an international conference this fall that will take up these very themes. To the question then of how to collaborate to improve people's lives, strengthen societies, and reduce conflict. I say democracy, development, security, and inclusion. 
While this conference begins with ideas and vision, it must also fortify us as leaders to inspire the entire world to a better future. A future where democracy is reality. Reality is security and combination results in better lives for all of the citizens. I embrace this role and both offer and ask each of you the support to meet these obligations, confident in our mission and sure of its successes. I applaud to all of you for all of your efforts and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Long, PhD candidate at the University of California, San Diego. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm James Long, PhD student at UC San Diego and now assistant professor at the University of Washington. In September of 2010, my colleagues and I received a Development Innovation Ventures grant from USAID to develop and test a new election monitoring technology specifically designed to reduce fraud. Fair elections are a cornerstone of democratic government, but many elections in new and fragile democracies suffer high levels of electoral fraud and as a consequence, post-election violence. The U.S. and its allies expend a great deal of resources on shoring up elections in these countries. For example, the international community spent over a quarter of a billion dollars to support Afghanistan's 2009 election. Now, given this investment, there is much to be gained from using proven, cost-effective, and scientifically rigorous technologies to detect and reduce fraud. We set out to address that need with a solution that was in part a very simple behavioral intervention and in part a scalable photo-based technology. And we tested it through randomized control trials. We start with a large sample of polling stations in Afghanistan, 471 in this experiment. We then sent local observers to deliver a letter to polling station managers and about half of our sample. The letter states that local observers will photograph the station's final vote tally. The observers then return after polls close with digital cameras and smartphones and take photographs of these paper tallies in both the stations that received the letter and those that did not. And by measuring the differences uh, in different kinds of uh, fraud across the treated and the control stations, we can document the effect of our technology. And our results are very, very promising. Data from the 471 polling stations in Afghanistan, which was about 8% of the, of the total that were open on election day, show that the letter's announcement of monitoring reduced the theft of tallies and sensitive election materials by 60%. It reduced fraudulent votes for the most politically powerful candidates by 25%. Building from this initial success, Qualcomm partnered with our team at UC San Diego to engineer a smartphone application to scale up the project for Uganda's 2011 election. In 1,000 polling stations in Uganda, we found strong evidence that the letter caused a reduction in the theft of election materials and an even stronger reduction in other forensic fraud measures. 
We developed this technology with the explicit goal of scaling it up, spreading it through viral adoption and crowdsourced implementation. And in addition to professional researchers, we aim to include networks of civil society groups and citizen activists. If successful, this method could scale to every cell phone owning voting citizen in any country uh, who wants to monitor their elections. We envision that our technology is a new tool for citizens to use to hold their political leaders accountable with free and fair elections and ultimately with minimal foreign assistance. Thank you.